Friends, I am so excited about this episode. I wish that I, like I could do a happy dance, but then I would lose the microphone. I get to introduce you to my friend and someone that I consider a mentor, LaShonda Brown. She has not only mentored me from afar, but I actually, as I said in the intro, have gone through one of her coaching programs on YouTube and she is genius and that's understating understating. She has her hands in so many things in the tech space. And y'all know I'm a techie girl. And so I feel like we're kindred spirits. And so please help me welcome LaShonda to the podcast today. LaShonda, I'm so glad you're here. Tell us all about you. I'm really excited. And I think, you know, it's always so fun for me to just have conversations with other believers because it just, it changes the atmosphere. You know, yeah. people feel it, people sense it. And um, I'm just so grateful to the internet for connecting us because you are just such a joy to talk to. So this should be good. Oh, thanks. I'm excited about it. So tell us about your business journey. What, how did it start? I don't even know that I know that. Yeah. My origin story is not typical. And I guess I should probably start with the fact that I've never worked a full-time job for anyone else. Wow. So everything is kind of odd <laughs> from that perspective. And it's awesome. Not your norm. Yeah, it's great. Definitely blessed. But also, you know, I look back and I'm like, what was 21 year old me thinking? But, you know, <laughs> love her, love her. Um, but, you know, I, I left my job selling assessment tests and snacks um, okay. in college because my husband wanted to start a video production company. And, and so the funny part is I really thought that I was going to graduate with my theater degrees, move to New York, do Broadway. And he just changed the plans. And honestly, I'm so grateful because I have a lot of friends who went to performing arts high school with me and they're Tony nominated and all these different things. But at the end of the day, it set me on a trajectory where I'm doing the thing I genuinely believe God created me to do. Yeah. And so I wouldn't have gotten there if I hadn't said yes to marriage and yes to running a video production company in the Blue Ridge Mountains. You know, it's That's not awesome. the mecca of filmmaking. I can tell you that, <laughs> but we love it. We love it. And so honestly, I just, I did that for 10 years. I found a sweet spot selling videos to the federal government and to the state. So we would do these like tourism videos, you know, and videos for national parks and, and things like that. And it was fun until it wasn't, you know, the, <laughs> the 20 plus page proposals for a mini documentary. Oh, no. Just after a while, you're like, you know, I'd like to do something different. And mm -hmm. so I, I took a chance. I had a YouTube channel on the side and I said, okay, well, what if I double down on YouTube? You keep doing the video production company just in case, but I'm going <laughs> to see what I can make happen over here. And for a whole year, I didn't sell anything. That wasn't the intention, but I got to like September and I realized I hadn't made a product yet. Mm. I hadn't really tried to do a launch or anything crazy like that. And then I just kind of committed to it. I'm like, you know what, for an entire year, I'm going to get to know my audience and figure out like, what are they struggling with and what can I bring to the table? And so ultimately that set me on a journey to really be that mentor that I always wanted yeah. and teach people how I'm leveraging tech and YouTube to work 20 hours a week. And that has just become my song that people are tired and, you know, I only got one trick It's going to mm -hmm. have to be YouTube and tech. Cause that's what I know works. But it works for so many different industries. And it's just been a joy to take that blueprint in my life as a case study and apply it to other people. Yeah, that's amazing. I, I, you know, I think for a lot of people, I know it was for me for a really long time. We discussed this probably several times over our coaching period, but YouTube can be really intimidating for people, but I don't think it has to be. And I think that you make it very, accessible to those who might normally find it overwhelming. Talk to me a little bit about um, the people that come to you and kind of the objections that you see that you're pretty easily able to dispel and put them at ease in going into the YouTube realm. 
I think the most important thing that I have been able to educate people on is that YouTube is a search engine. Mm -hmm. It's not social media. And it also has multiple surfaces. And I think people don't quite understand that. When you look at Instagram, Instagram is not just your feed, right? It's your your feed content, it's reels, it's stories, it's lives, Mm -hmm. it's DMs. All of those are different services that you can use to market your business and drive traffic to your offers. YouTube is the same way. As of right now, there's not an ability to direct message, but there's the community tab, there's YouTube shorts, there's feed content, there are live streams. And so ultimately when someone says, I can see how YouTube could be helpful, Mm -hmm. but I'm overwhelmed. I don't know where to start. I don't know how long the video should be. I go, okay, let's start talking about what surface do you even want to be on? And that like blows people's minds. They're like, oh my gosh, I didn't even think about that. I'm like, you could literally just go live. You could just have a live channel. Or I have some friends who are just YouTube shorts. They just do vertical content. They don't do horizontal content because they think better in those short bursts of time. And so Mm -hmm. really teaching people that YouTube offers the opportunity to educate with video from multiple different perspectives, people feel less boxed in. And then I'm able to kind of guide them on a custom strategy for what works best for them. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that people forget about shorts and, uh, and that's such an integral part since it's been introduced. Talk to me a little bit about the community tab, because I know that for a lot of people, they're like, what? YouTube has a community component to it. How, how do most people utilize that? The community tab is interesting because in a way it gets a lot of traffic that people wouldn't expect it to get. Interesting. So the best way to kind of think about it is imagine you have essentially a Facebook feed on your YouTube channel. So you can upload photos, you can upload video. One thing I really like about it is you can actually do polls. And so for me, if you have nothing else to say, just a simple poll about which title resonates most with you or which topic would you like to see me cover, that is the quickest way to boost engagement on your YouTube channel is to simply ask a this or that question. People love limited options, right? So don't- write a dissertation, just ask them a very simple this or that. And they engage like crazy. And it's not just your followers. YouTube will push that out just on the feed. Um, So it's kind of wild. A lot of people don't utilize it. And for people who leverage shorts, it's their way of having a place to put clickable links because you can't put links in a short description anymore. So they'll use the community tab for that. Okay. I had not... I'm going to be honest. I don't utilize the the community tab probably as much as I should, if at all. (laughs) Bad, bad student. Um, (laughs) A lot of people don't though, because you, you're so fixated on the video portion that you don't even think about, like there have been times where I will just use a community tab to market the fact that there's a new video. Okay. That's fascinating. And so smart. I need to make sure that I'm taking a note to start doing that because I think that's brilliant. So does, you know, we hear the buzzword algorithm and I think especially where social media is concerned, it's become um, a cuss word, (laughs) the the algorithm. Uh, Do you find that the YouTube algorithm works the same? Does it work different? Um, Is there, I mean, you know, people talk all the time about hacking the algorithm or figuring out the algorithm. I don't know that that's even possible, but talk to us about the YouTube algorithm a little bit and maybe the best ways that you can work within the algorithm to get your stuff out there and to grow your channel. Ooh, there's so many angles I could take. So I don't want (laughs) to make you feel like you're drinking from a fire hose. Um, But let's just say this, YouTube is a search engine. But it's not just any search engine. It's also owned by Google. Mm. If you can rank within the first few search results on YouTube, you will show up in the videos tab of Google. Wow. They're connected. So when you're served up video suggestions in a Google search, 
they are showing you YouTube results. Like that's where they come from because they're integrated, right? So the reality is with certain topics, it just makes sense to do an SEO driven piece of content Mm -hmm. to simply rank in the Google search and get new eyeballs on your channel that would have never been searching for you otherwise, right? Yeah. So it's less about the algorithm as it is understanding that it's a search engine, not a social platform. So it has nothing to do with, you need a lot of likes, you need a lot of comments. It's not, mm-hmm. That's not what you're after. What you're after is, okay, maybe what's a trending topic or what's something that people in my industry are searching for and how can I formulate my YouTube content to rank so that I appear in the Google search and now both Google and YouTube are driving traffic to my channel. And so you can leverage tech tools to do that. And that's a really fun thing to navigate because then it takes the guesswork out of it. But at the end of the day, you've got to understand that the purpose of YouTube is to capture attention and then drive them off platform. Mm -hmm. I think too many people get caught up in, oh, well, does the algorithm like me or hate me? Like that's irrelevant. Like as long as the eyeballs that you get understand what you want them to do next, the piece of content is effective, whether 15 people watched it or 15,000. But if they watch it and all they do is go, oh, that was entertaining. Then you've actually missed the mark because the people I teach are service providers. They're not content creators. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately you want them to sign up for your service, not just be entertained. Yeah. That's interesting because, you know, I, and I think YouTube understands that the idea is to get people off of the platform with whatever call to action you have. Whereas social media, the goal is to keep them on platform and you almost get dinged if you try to take them off the platform. So I think that's just one other piece that makes YouTube so brilliant, comparatively speaking to you know social media channels when you're trying to market your business. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think that's why when I try to show people how to get to that point of having a 20 hour work week, I'm like, you're not going to be able to get to that place of ease in your business. If you're marketing on a frantic platform that requires Mm -hmm. constant care and attention. Yeah. I can post a YouTube video that will continue. Like my top 10 videos right now are all at least two years old. (laughs) Like that's insane. Wow. And that's the truth. I can t- I can look at my dashboard right now and I know that. And so the reality is you're playing the long game, but you also aren't playing the hectic game. And yeah. that's what I care most about. Like, I don't want to feel hurried and rushed and beholden to some tech company that's constantly making changes where I can never strategize. And so ultimately yes. YouTube for me, I, I know content marketing is powerful. I just need to choose where I want to post my content. And right now that combo of LinkedIn and YouTube is just really hitting. So that's what I'm doing. Amen, sister. So you shifted your social media strategy, what, around a year ago, would you say? Mm-hmm. Probably around a year ago. And I, I'm, like, I'm sure you're hearing it as much, if not more, as I am that the term social media burnout. I'm raising my hand. I put myself into that category. And so tell us a little bit about what led you to change your social media strategy and what that looks like now versus what you were doing in the past. And your channel's grown when you shifted, right? Yeah, it's been it's been interesting. I I I won't take credit for this. Um, I was listening to a friend's podcast and she threw out the term minimum viable posting schedule. And like, as a tech girly, I was like, "Mm, I like that. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately, I literally just did this this past weekend. As I said, okay, let me reverse engineer my marketing strategy. What is the least I can do to keep the lights on? Because I know how to do the most. Yeah. I literally, girl, girl, I know how to pump out some content. But I'm like, (laughs) if I was like hanging on by a thread and Mm -hmm. could like only do bare minimum, what would that practically look like? Like, can I quantify that? And so I just started looking back at the data and I'm always polling my community. And so I was actually able to tangibly see 
if you could only do the minimum, this is all you need to do. And it was just eye opening because I'm like, that's it. That's really. And so everything else beyond that, what purpose is that serving? Right. You know what I mean? Like, is it just taking time? Is there a return on my investment of time? Like what, what's happening there? If I now am very clear about what that minimum looks like. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I started looking at my channel and said, okay, if my husband and our team can't help me edit, what, what do I do? What do I do when he has client work? What do I do when he gets sick or what have you? And so I was like, you know what? If I am the sole person responsible for this channel, I can live stream that I can do. Yeah. And so that's partly where it came from. And then also I wanted a place to kind of tether myself down to. So YouTube felt less like a hobby and more like a job because for so long it had been a hobby. Sure. And so every Monday at 10, I go live. And if I can't get to any feed content that week, well, I have content that's sufficient enough to last me for seven days and people love it. I don't have to edit it. It's so much fun. And so I think just finding that sweet spot has been amazing because my prep time is now down to like, I don't know, email included, I would say less than an hour. Wow. I need to go live to I'm talking. And it's, that's it's amazing. pretty great. Yeah. That is amazing. And I know that in your, um, in your memberships, you talk more strategy and what all of that looks like. And so don't worry, everyone, we're going to link all that stuff in the show notes for you. Cause you're going to want to get in on this. I promise you <laughs> it is, it it's mind blowing. And I can say personally, it allows you to take a big sigh of relief that the, just the pressure is lifted, that you don't have to do all the things and you can still have an incredibly successful business as noted by what's happening in Lashana's business. So talk to us a little bit about your 20 hour work week philosophy, philosophy, because I know that that is super important to you. And I think it has, it just piques the interest for any entrepreneur who is burning the candle at both ends, like so many of us do, thinking that we have to work longer, harder in order to get anywhere. And I think you've broken that mold and shown that that's actually a fallacy. Yeah. You know, I, it's so funny. Like, I remember when I heard the term signature signature keynote and I thought, oh my gosh, I got to box myself in. Like, what could I consistently talk about, you know, for at least a year? Mm -hmm. And I came up with a keynote called Work Less, Live More. And as soon as I named it that, I'm like, oh my gosh, girl, you better be able to back that up because that's (laughs) that's a pretty big claim. You're going to do less work. And, and live a more fulfilling life. Yeah. Okay. And even just that pushback in my own mind showed mm-hmm. me how important this was. Like we yeah. live in a culture that glorifies overworking and yeah. that we're teaching people over and over and over again, by the way that we market online, that more equals more, more work equals more money. And that's mm-hmm. not true. And so I'm like, okay, well, how do I, how do I get to a place where I genuinely love what I do, have the energy to do it. And like burnout is not even remotely in the picture. And it really started with giving myself permission to take things off my plate that weren't working, Mm. to start looking at my commitments and saying, truthfully, I don't care what everybody else is doing. What is a profit producing activity for you? Mm -hmm. What actually moves the needle for your business? Like, don't worry about what they say on podcasts or trainings or what have you. Like, you can see the numbers. What moves the needle? And so getting some of that thing, some of those things off my plate, I was like, oh my gosh, like I just freed up so much time. So just doing that was a game changer. And then of course, you know, started to delegate to team members and then started to leverage tech to automate things. And before I knew it, I was like, okay. I'm actually able to get to a place of deep focus work now. 
20 hours of deep focus work for me is most people's 40 hour work week. Yeah. And so instead of working 40 and spending half of my time distracted and scattered, I just hunker down from 10 to three, Monday through Thursday. And I just focus. And by Thursday, my brain is mush. And then your girl (laughs) is done. But then I have my Friday to just do whatever I want. And I have my weekend. And so, you know, for me, it was like, just truncate the time, be super focused, say no to things that aren't moving the needle, regardless Mm -hmm. of what everybody else is doing. Yeah. And it will change your life. Yeah. That's, that's so good. So good. I, um, I think that, so two things that I pulled out of that. Number one, I don't think that the majority of business owners spend enough time actually looking at what's working and what's not working to even be able to know what to take off their plate. They're just doing all the things that they see everyone else doing and what they hear they're supposed to do in air quotes, um, because they don't know any different. And we just don't take the time to stop and reflect and look at the data and Anyway, I just think that's so super important. I know that I have started doing that in my own business and I've stepped way back from social media and I am not suffering. My business is not suffering. <laughs> I'm not suffering mentally from being having, having to be on social media and my business is not suffering because I'm not on social media as much as I was. And so I think if people gave themselves permission and the discipline to actually look at that return on investment, they would be able to spend their time more wisely. Like you're saying, I think the other thing that I really want to encourage people to do is go on to LaShonda's YouTube channel, which also will be linked in the show notes because she is, she's the tech master for starters, but she has so many little short tutorial training videos on tech tools that you can use to help you with the focused work. It's, I think we get stuck in this multitasking, jumping from here to there to here to there, and it's it's counterproductive. So let's talk about focused work for just a minute. What is What does your typical focus period look like for you? Well, lo-fi music and... Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I honestly, I've started putting my phone on the charger in my bedroom. Like it's just not even in the room. Um, I, cause I did, I read some books and they talked about how like subconsciously you'll just grab for your phone, just out of habit, Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. just to unlock it, just cause you're used to touching it. Um, so just literally remove my phone from my office and, um, yeah, I've got my digital calendar. I have my physical daily planner and I just, I pick three three things that I try to get done. I do a mindful morning routine and then 10 to three, I'm tethered to this computer. And every hour I take a break, go walk somewhere, see some sunlight, touch some grass. And yeah. That's amazing. I love that. It's pretty chill. (laughs) I could get it. I can get on board with chill for sure. Um, Talk to us about your morning routine. I know that we're going to link. Is that where we're linking the morning routine? What are we so I do have, I have a video where I literally break down my morning oh, great. routine. Yeah. So you can definitely go check that out. Um, okay. And I, I think what I realize is, is that when I don't start my day in a frantic manner, mm. I tend to have a chill day. Yeah. So, you know, some folks talk about the 5 a.m. Uh, wake up and they're doing the most, but really for me, it, it was like, I need to start my day mindfully and making the main thing, the main thing. Mm -hmm. And so taking time to pray, to journal, to exercise, you know, these, these things are so important because I think ultimately you have to recalibrate your mind to understand what the priorities of life actually are. When you start your day and you grab your phone and you open up social media You tell your brain it's more important for you to be consuming than creating. And that's not what God created you to do. And so it's like, before I start consuming other people's crap and becoming hyper aware of what everyone else is doing, like, what is God saying? You know, what does he want me to do today? 
not what is somebody else doing. And so I think that reframe, it, it really does set the tone for your day. And when you don't start frantic, when you don't yeah. start from, oh, what do I have to troubleshoot? What fire do I have to put out? Oh, it just, I mean, it makes you joyful. It makes you mm-hmm. peaceful. It makes you settled and grounded as a person. And these are the things that people are paying for. They're not paying for the pain by a thread version of you. They're paying for your expertise. Yeah. And so you've got to do what you need to do to get into that headspace so that you can deliver, so that you can glorify God in what you're doing, and so that you can sustain being an entrepreneur because it's an incredibly difficult thing to do. Yeah. And sometimes we forget we're doing the hard thing for the potential payoff, but it's still a hard thing. Mm-hmm. Mm. That's, that is, um, I don't think I've ever heard it phrased the way that you just did, that we were not made to consume. We were made to create, we're made in the image of a creative God. And so if the first thing that we're doing is consuming, we're missing the mark. That is so powerful. And something, I think I probably need to write that in about a thousand places. So it's right in front of my face because I think it it literally could change so much in the way that people go about their day. If they're less worried about consuming and more worried about what does God want you to create today? What has he gifted you to create today? So I do want to talk for just a minute about your faith and how that has played a part in your business journey. Because I know as women of faith in business, it's always good to hear other people's perspective and how they see the Lord working in their own businesses and really just are encouraged by what he's doing in the life of other entrepreneurs. So tell us a little bit about how faith plays a part in your business. Well, it's everything. <laughs> There's that. Yeah. Um, but you know, I I did, I had a moment where I just made a conscious effort to not filter myself mm. when I wanted to rejoice in what God was doing. Because I think for too long, I, I was worried about offending people yeah. or having to deal with the comments. And I remember one day it hit me like a ton of bricks that it would be unethical to cut God out of my business story Mm. because it's his business. Mm. He's blessing it. Mm -hmm. I'm doing the work, but he's blessing the work, you know? And so it's like, it's an incomplete story without sharing that. Mm. And I really want to show up as my full self online so that people understand who they're giving their money to and who they're listening to. And I just kept going back to, it is not ethical for you to redact this from your story. This is the truth. Yeah. By not sharing, by not saying, yes, I know strategy. I'm consistent. I did these things, but if God didn't want to bless it, it wouldn't matter. Mm -hmm. Like that's important to communicate because people People are going through it right now. And, you know, for you to to act like, you know, it's this series of events that you orchestrated Mm. that resulted in where you are when that's not actually the case, um, it it robs people of the opportunity to hear really awesome testimony. Mm. And so I just started saying like, you know what, if it repels people, great, because it's going to attract the right people. Yeah. And that's what I started to see. You know, I didn't rebrand as, you know, your Christian tech educator, (laughs) but I'm going to talk about Jesus. Yeah. And if it offends you, you have every right to unsubscribe and to unfollow and to distance yourself if that's not what you want to hear. But he's everything. And if I don't tell you the truth, I'm going to be held accountable for that. And yep. that's what actually matters. So that's yeah. where I'm at with that topic. That's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. I am so appreciative of you giving us your time today. You have no idea. And just tell everybody where they can find you. How can they connect with you? And 
all the things because they're going to need you in their business lives. <laughs> All the things. All the well, things. you can go to LashondaBrown.com. That's my home base. And, you know, that'll redirect you to all sorts of places. Choose your own adventure. You want something <laughs> free? I got you. You got $10. I'll take it. You know, I, I, I really just want to be recklessly generous with what I know because yeah. I want to see people walking in more freedom and I know how to get there, but you are going to have to watch a tutorial or two. And so if you're willing to do that, then we can make some progress. That is amazing. Thank you so much again for me, for your time. I really appreciate you. And I know that people have gotten so much value out of the time that they spent with us today. So thank you so much. You're so welcome. <laughs>